Church, grace and peace to you this morning, and a blessed World Communion Sunday to you as well. It is good to be here worshiping with you this day. I um, noticed during the children's message that Pastor Sarah pointed out her stole once again this week, and I thought it might be fitting that I point out my stole this week. Um, This is a stole that was made for me by a group of ladies who quilt in the church that I previously served. Um, They gathered together months before my ordination, which was right before I uh, was reappointed here to Wesley, and they said, we're gonna make a a stole for Justin uh, on his ordination. And they chose this color blue uh, because it's fitting for baptism, but it's also a liturgical color that we don't get to see all that often. So they thought it would be something that I could wear on special occasions. So here I am on this special occasion, connecting myself and connecting all of us with a little church in North Dakota, celebrating on World Communion Sunday. So what a great day it is to be together. And of course, you know it is World Communion Sunday. As you can tell, we've got our our baskets and our cups ready to go, and we'll celebrate in our pews here in a moment. A fine day to be celebrating with our brothers and sisters all around the world. But before we get there, we need to spend some time in the book of Hebrews, which I think is fitting because as I spent some time this past week preparing for this morning's message, I came to believe that these passages that we're about to read have more to do with communion than we might first realize. You see, these passages spend a considerable amount of time making the case for the early church, which was still largely made up of Jewish believers, that Jesus was both fully God and fully human. And for me, this is one of the theological ideas that makes communion so relevant, even in today's world. For me, it's if and only if Jesus is both God and human, that he's capable of dying and rising to save the world, to save me from our sins, the act which we remember when we take communion. And so as we read together this morning, let us focus on that theme. Let us listen for those instances when the author of Hebrews connects the dots between Christ's humanity and Christ's divinity for us. With that in mind, let us hear this morning's scripture passages from the letter according, or not according to, the letter for the Hebrews. Let's hear these words. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world's. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And from the second chapter, Now God did not subject the coming world, about which we are speaking, to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them, for a little while, lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in a subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by uh, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. People of faith, the author of Hebrews wastes no time getting to it, does he? This is a, uh, a, a, a scripture passage that you can tell from my fumbled reading uh, that's full of a lot of words and is heavy on theology. So let's try to unpack some of that, shall we? For me, the first of three claims about Jesus' identity as both God and man starts right off the bat in verse 1. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. This opening sentence seems to identify the intended audience of this book, the Jewish people. And it would appear that in order to get the attention of this intended audience, the author was fairly intentional about appealing to their faith heritage, which had been revealed to them over time through the prophets. And continuing into verse 2, the author does something interesting. He compares Jesus to the prophets of old. But instead of just stopping there, he goes one step further, calling him a son. Now, did anyone else notice that little letter A hanging out there? Most of us probably glanced right over it, assuming that in this sentence, that tiny one-letter word is there simply to support the word son to call that word out for us. And while I don't think we'd be wrong to assume that, I might suggest that the word A is there for yet another reason, to serve as a modifier. You see, if the word A modifies the word son, it signals to us readers that all those prophets who came before shared in Jesus' unique calling. Jesus was one of many sons or prophets who came to proclaim God's message. But those amongst us who have a keen eye will notice that at the bottom of our Bibles, it is also in the footnotes, uh, uh, there is also a little note that says, original language might say, the. And in fact, a might be translated, the, indicating that Jesus held a special place amongst all these other prophets. As I studied this sentence this week, I became increasingly convinced that while the author was trying to draw a line for his audience, connecting Jesus to the prophets before him, this author was also maintaining that somehow Jesus was unique among them by calling Jesus a son. Now, if we continue reading, we find more evidence to support this idea. The author says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever remember reading anywhere in Scripture about any other prophet who was credited with the creation of the world. And can you imagine being the heir of all creation? But here we are. Jesus is creator and heir. Now, I don't think we should overlook these claims while we're here because I think they tell us something important about Jesus' identity. You see, by crediting Jesus with creating the world, the author is saying that Jesus was present since the beginning of time, something his Jewish audience would have only previously thought applied to God, the Almighty. And then, what does it mean to call Jesus heir of all things? I think it means that the author thought Jesus would be around at the end of time. And so here we have it, Jesus from the beginning to the end of time. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever read Revelation 22:13 13, when Jesus declared, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end? So it is in Hebrews. The author is saying that Jesus is not just any ordinary prophet who is here for a blink of an eye, but yet Jesus is the prophet of prophets, capital P. Jesus is, in fact, more than a prophet. Jesus is God come to us. 
which is exactly the declaration that verse 3 continues on to make. Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very beginning, very very being. People of faith, this is the good news that the author of Hebrews was trying to convey to his audience. Jesus is God come to us. Good news? Yeah. And only the first of three such pronouncements to be made in our scripture passage this morning. So let's continue. Verse 4 of this first section serves as a transitional verse into the second section we read today. Verses 5 through 12 of chapter 2. In that it identifies Jesus as being superior to the angels. A theme that continues well into the next section. But if we remember correctly, this statement is quickly contradicted in the next chapter. Let's hear chapter 2, verse 9 again. We do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So why the contradiction? Well, it seems that the author wanted to note in the very first section, right off the bat in this letter, that Jesus is equal to God. Therefore, he must be above the angels. Makes sense, right? And in the second section, he notes that Jesus had to suffer death, which would mean for at least a short period, he had to be lower than the angels, since angels do not suffer human death. Now, I'm going to guess that many of you are thinking, that's nice, Pastor, but what does any of this have to do with Christ being both fully human and fully divine? Well, for me, it would seem that in order for Christ to be fully human, he would have to be lower than the angels for some time. And for him to be fully God, he would have to be higher than the angels for some time, since angels are close to God in the heavens. These sentences about angels serve no other purpose than to help those early believers rationalize Jesus' place here on earth and in heaven. They are placeholders, so to speak, fully God, because he's obviously more than an angel, and fully human, because he was obviously less than an angel when he suffered and died for us. Congregation, the author of Hebrews, goes on to make his final case for the divine humanity of Christ in the last few verses of this passage. Let's hear them again, starting with verse 10. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Here the author presents probably his most relevant argument yet. Because God chose to save humanity from our sins, it is fitting that he would use someone who has been where we have been, someone who has seen what we have seen, someone who has experienced what we have experienced to do so. To save us, God chose someone who is capable of calling us brothers and sisters, someone fully human like us. And his name is Jesus. Because he's also fully divine, upon completion of his task, his death on Calvary, that is, he took up a spot next to the throne of God where he calls us brothers and sisters, advocating on our behalf before God, the one who ultimately saves us. Fully human, fully God, and we stand fully amazed. So where does all of this leave us, congregation? Well, I think it leaves us marveling 
at this God-man who gave up his life for our sake. It leaves us feeling a deep sense of gratitude toward God for finding a way to reconcile us to him. It leaves us sitting at a table, ready to feast on a symbolic meal that was set before us by the one who loved us enough to die for us, who loved us enough to rise again, to guide us toward new life in him. Congregation all over the world today, people are gathering together to celebrate this same meal. And as it occurs to us, so it occurs to them. We are sitting here not because of what we have done, but because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Amen? So I ask, what will our response be? Well, I think we have many options, of course, but a couple of good ones that came to mind for me were first, I think we owe it to Christ to look around us at our brothers and sisters, at his brothers and sisters all around the world, the ones he too has called beloved, and make sure that they have also been invited to sit at this table. We should do everything in our power to eliminate the barriers that divide us from our brothers and sisters. We should stop looking for the worst in one another. We should seek to help the lost find their way home again. We should open doors for those to whom they've been shut for too long. We should anticipate that this table will grow as large as God intends it to, and when it seems we're about to run out of room, we should ask Christ to open our hearts more so that we can always help find room for another. A second response I think we should have to God's amazing salvific love, I think we should give our love in return. A table has been set by Christ, and at his invitation, we are invited to feast at it. Congregation, can you fathom that? At God's invitation, you and I, just just us, lowly us, We're invited to feast at this table. The best way we can honor God is to join God at this table, taking the bounty of his love, accepting his forgiveness, and offering our gratitude in return. So let us come. The table is set. And now as we turn to our liturgy on page 12, Let us prepare our hearts to accept God's grace and let us express our thanks to God in return.